Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Joy Alcoholic. My home group is also the Nuts and Bolts Group in Prairie Village, Kansas. My sobriety date is November 14th, 1991. And uh, for that, I am absolutely grateful to you people and um, to Alcoholics Anonymous and to, to my God. And it is. It's absolutely an honor to, to, to be here. And it's really an honor to get to come down with my best friend, Tiffany. Um, we have a great time together. Um, and she is my best friend. And, and you know what? If you're new here tonight and you're saying, well, I don't want a best friend named Tiffany. I want a best friend, say, named Lee. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm telling you, I've talked to Lee. He's a fabulous gentleman. I'm telling you, though, you want a woman best friend. That is, it is the women in this program. <laughs> It is the women in this program that are going to pick you up and carry you when you are at your lowest and walk this deal with you. And, um, you know, for a gal who wanted a best friend named Lee myself, um, I never would have thought that I would have the life that I have today, not just with sobriety and a family and all that, but with the women in it. And it is an absolute privilege to get to sponsor women. It's an absolute privilege to have women friends. And I just, I, I'm thrilled to be here. So, so thank you. I want to thank Janice and Katie for picking me up. It's so funny. Typical AA. Um, Hi, I'm Katie. I'm going to be picking you up. I said, great. We're in a black SUV. I said, okay, see you there. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I I tell Tiffany, somebody in a black SUV is picking us up. She's like, there's a lot of them out there. (laughs) And I said, yeah, we'll figure it out. And we came out of... uh, terminal and we were walking and I saw a woman and she was looking at me and I was looking at her and I knew absolutely without even asking and it was her and and it was and um so thank you for picking us up and uh just thrilled thrilled to be here um I should tell you that uh I think I introduced myself with a home group a sobriety date I have a sponsor and I sponsor women and I read the big book um which are to me are the real basics of the deal and um without those I don't have a sobriety date. I don't have a family. I don't have any of that other other stuff that I get to have here. And um, I'm going to tell you, I have no idea how this talk is going to go because the morning started off not well. <laughs> and um, it's going to go one of two ways. I mean, we woke, we got to the airport on time, but, a, you know, up in security. Um, of course, out of all the cars, ours got chosen to have the bomb detection thing gone through and searched and all of that. And then we, we in Kansas City, we have three terminals. And we went to see, and uh, we got out of our car, got our luggage, started walking up. Tiffany goes, oh, we're at American. And I'm like, oh, dang, we're going to have to walk. We're supposed to be at B. So we had to get back in the car, drive back over, get out. I mean, it was just, and it's been like that all day, all day. So um, I have Pat is here somewhere. There she is. She told me I better do good. I said, if I don't, just cut me off, and I'll sit down, and we can all go party. (laughs) Um so let me tell you, I am uh, I am the oldest of three children. I am adopted. Uh, my mom didn't think she could have kids, um, so they adopted me. And then um, pretty soon my brother came along, and obviously she found out she could have kids, so she had another one. Now, I grew up with this mean brother who would constantly say things to me like, you're not our blood. And um, and I would cry, and I would run to my dad, and my dad was my hero, and he would say, you know what, the next time he says this, you tell him this. So I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I agitated him so he would say something like that. And he, one day he said, you're not our blood. And I said, well, at least mom and dad knew what I looked like. <laughs> and uh, he never said it again. And so, so, you know, I grew up. We had a typical Leva to Beaver family, I thought, very just normal, very boring, very Catholic. Um, and, you know, I just got in trouble here and trouble there. I, was, I wasn't one of those speakers that started drinking when I was four and a half or, 
or, or even 14 and a half. I think I was almost 18 when I started drinking. And so I had a lot of middle school and high school years to get through. And, you know, I, um, I don't recall necessarily feeling like an outsider. I just know that I, I never felt like I fit any place. And so, therefore, I would hang out with the jocks. I'd hang out with the cheerleaders. I'd hang out with the band geeks. I'd hang out with the nerds, the pot smokers. I just bounced all around because I just didn't feel like I fit anywhere. And um, I know that, ba- um, I don't remember, well, it, back then, uh, the drinking age was 18. And um, I remember I started drinking, and we would go out on the weekends. We'd go to bars. We'd come home late. Sometimes we'd miss curfew. It was just kind of... Um, at, it was kind of normal, and um, but I also remember at the end of the night when we were leaving the bar, my friends would be leaving, and I would be running around taking the pictures of half-empty beer and drinking the rest of it at every little table, and it didn't occur to me then that, oh my goodness, I must be an alcoholic. I just thought, these people are wasting <laughs> beer, and um, so, you know, even from the very get-go, my drinking was definitely different from my friends. And, and um, even though I didn't get in a whole lot of trouble early on, it certainly caught up with me. Um, I remember I came down here to Daytona Beach for spring break, and uh, I don't remember it. <laughs> I remember getting off the plane, and the next day I remember waking up in a closet, and those are the only two things I remember of the whole entire week. I do remember, though, getting off the plane and all of us had, everybody had on, you know, puka shells and I survived spring break in Daytona t-shirt and I came home pregnant without a clue of how it happened (laughs) because, you see, I'm a blackout drinker (laughs) and, um, you know, I don't, did did you hear me say I'm Catholic? Well, um, you're not supposed to do that. And so I tried to hide it from my parents for the longest time. And, you know, moms just know. Ugh. They just know. And, and um, she kept asking me, are you pregnant? I'd be like, are you kidding me, mother? That's gross. And, um, <laughs> you know, she finally took me to our, found out I was pregnant. And, you know, my parents did what I think a lot of parents um, back then, maybe even today do. They shipped me off to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I worked for my dad's office down there. I had the baby, put the baby up for adoption, came back to Kansas City, and we never spoke about it again. And, um, you know, uh, I don't remember I don't remember being devastated or anything like that. I mean, I'm adopted, so I, I got that. I absolutely knew that there was no possible way in heck that I could raise a child. I didn't want to raise a child. So um, that wasn't a problem for me. And I went back to my life, and I went back to getting in a little bit more trouble, and and things started happening, and and things like, you know, when you wake up, and you don't know where you are, and you have to go outside and find a street sign um, to figure out where you are, um, things started happening like, you know, there's a Carrie Underwood song where she's singing about not even knowing your last name. Well, I thought she was doing pretty good, because there were many a times I didn't know his first And, um, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, the old, it's, we're in a women's, it's much different than when you have, when we have men here, so I can talk freely. Um, you know, when you go and you wake up and you're like, are you sure you're the one I came home with last night? (laughs) And, um, or there were times, you know, I'd wake up in, in, in a parking space without a car. And, um, I mean, these things could happen to anyone. And uh, just, oh, you know, it's laughable, crazy stuff. And so the really bad stuff hadn't started happening for me yet. <laughs> A normal person would be devastated <laughs> by now in the talk. Um, you know, and so... Anyway, I, I start working at, at, at a bar. You know, I had lost jobs, I, and, and, you know, I had crashed cars. And, you know, when it's icy and you're driving up the driveway and you don't put the brakes on too soon or maybe too late and you just drive through the garage door, I mean, it was the ice. And um, those things were happening. But what happened is is that I uh, started working at a bar. And which I just think that's where we're destined to work. I think that's where we're supposed to work. I think that's where God wants us to work. And um, I started working at a bar, and I met him. 
And he was a bartender, and I was a waitress. And I got down on my knees that night, and I thanked God, because this was destiny. It, he, was, he was putting us together. It was a match made in heaven. I mean, what could be better? And um, I'm the type of gal that when I meet you on Thursday, I fall in love with you on Friday, and we move in on Saturday. And, and, um, and I did indeed do that. And, and we went about our life. And, you know, we would sleep all day. We would get up. We'd go to work. We'd drink at work. We'd leave work. We'd go to a party. We'd smoke pot. We'd go to sleep. We'd get up and we'd do it all over again. And, and it was the best life. I thought it was the best life. And um, uh, one day he t- came home and he said, Joy, you have to move out. And I was like, why? And he said, because I'm gay. But it's not your fault. <laughs> and, uh, I went, fine. And... uh so I moved out and, and, um, you know, proceeded to do this and do that. And I was drinking, I was drinking all the time at this point, you know, I was drinking every day, but you know, when you have quarter draws on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday, and then you have dollar well drinks on Friday, and then you have taco Tuesday, and then you have Sunday night football. I mean, there's just, you know, yes, I drank every day. I mean, I had an event and, um, (laughs) um, so, you know, that's just what I'm doing. And then, you know, I get fired from the bar because I'm too drunk and they find me in one of the bathroom stalls. I mean, just constant stuff like this. And so I remember um, one day, uh, it was March of 89 and I got a DUI. And it's like, yeah, everybody gets one. And um, then it was April of 89 and I got another one. Bad luck. Then it was um, August of 89 and I got another one. And I was like, this has been a really rough year. And um, I think I have a problem. I'm just not going to drive anymore. <laughs> and so uh, 90 turned out to be pretty good. And uh, I remember, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm the type of person that I can, um, God, the lies that I can tell my brain that I, and, I, and believe them. Like the stuff that I can make up and actually believe is amazing to me. And I remember I was seeing this probation officer, and I just all of a sudden got this crazy idea. I was like, why should I go? I think they're going to lose my file. And um, (laughs) if they don't have a file on me, why should I waste anyone's time? So um, I just quit going. And um, I remember my attorney, he is also my cocaine dealer, he said, (laughs) "Um, Joy. You cannot go through your life always looking over your shoulder. I mean, you've got to turn yourself in. I was like, fine. So I went and I turned myself in that day, and it just so happened that uh, this particular judge was a dang recovering alcoholic. <laughs> and um, I remember thinking, you know, get on with this business. I got to go. And um, I remember he looked in my eyes and he said, Bailiff Cuffer, you're going to jail, Missy. And I went, well, I don't think all that's necessary. <laughs> and... um Uh, Apparently no one cared and off to jail I went and, you know, the cell door opens and I'm in my orange and with my shower shoes and I've got my bunk stuff and I walk in and I see like five people I know and I'm like, this is awesome. Now, a a, a normal person says to themselves, I have got to quit running with the rough crowd. (laughs) And, um, you know, I... I got to tell you, I got to be honest, I had a blast that week. And, you know, isn't it funny? We come to AA and we all, we think we have to exaggerate our stories. Like they're not big enough as it is, right? So I would come, I would, I was new and I'd say, yeah, I've done time. (laughs) And I'd done like seven days in county. (laughs) But uh, whatever. Anyway, um, so I was in jail for a week and, um, hung out, and I had the best time. And you know what? I can tell you today why I had a great time. It was because I was plucked out of my pathetic, miserable life for one whole week. I got to go somewhere for one whole week where the phone wasn't ringing, where my parents weren't harassing me, where I didn't have to check the mailbox and throw away mail. I mean, I was plucked out of my life. And so it was like a release. It was such a sense of relief, and I loved it. And then I got out of jail, and... and, um. You know, I went home, took a shower, got cleaned up, went straight to the bar. I mean, I love the bar scene. I loved it. I, you know what? I still love it. And um, 
I remember we went to the bar, and there was this huge banner, like the size of this one behind me, and it said, Welcome Home, Freebird Joy. And um, again, a normal person might say, I don't want anyone to know I was in jail. And my thought was, I have the best friends in the whole wide world. <laughs> and uh, met a boy at this jailbird party. That was a Wednesday, so we actually moved in together on Friday. And, um, you know, uh, by this time, you know, my parents by this time had pretty much said, you know what, we can't do this. We do not want to watch you die. They had gotten way back to digress. Um, when I was um, 21, I had met a guy, fell in love, we got engaged, and he was killed in a car wreck in 1985. And so my dad, being a, a good dad, sent me to counseling, like that was going to help me. I would rather be at the bar, but whatever. Um, so jump forward to this. My dad had been seeing this counselor still all these years later, and she had the nerve to teach him this thing called tough love. And so he basically said, we're done. We're not going to watch you die. You're off on your own. Goodbye. Don't contact us. Don't, don't. Just go away. And um, I was like, fine. I welcomed the idea because it meant I did, had one less person off of me. So anyway, um, so I'm with this guy. Um, he's, I actually, for some reason, had a house at the time. Um, and he moved in with me, actually, and life is good. We're partying all the time. I was actually holding down a job, but just barely. And um, he came home one day, or he stopped coming home on the weekend. That's what happened. And, um, you know, I'm not an idiot. I know what those guys are doing out there. And so I was like, I have to confront him. And so confronted him in the middle of the bar one night. He assured me up and down, oh, no, no, baby. Um, I'm not doing that. And uh, he goes, I'll show you what I'm doing. And, you know, um, that's how I got introduced to crack cocaine. <laughs> now, drugs are a part of my story, but they're a very small part of my story because I love alcohol. And, um, you know, my first thought was, whew, not a woman. And so I went down that road for a while. And then I remember one night we'd come home after a weekend and we'd spent my entire paycheck. We'd spent almost $3,000 and we're sitting in my house and I'm crying. And I wish to God I was, could tell you that I was crying because I'd seen the light. I wish to God I could tell you that I was crying because I had seen myself for who and what I was. I was crying because I was out of dope, I was out of booze, and I was out of money, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And he came over and he said the most glorious thing that any man in that situation can say to you. He said, it's going to be okay. I'm going to treatment. And I went, thank God, because you're sick. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we packed him up the next day and off to treatment he went. And three days later, I found out he didn't go to treatment. He got married. <laughs> Hasn't it ever happened to you? So I told him he had to get out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so this was, you know, by this time it's in 91, beginning of 91. And uh, March of 91, I'm, I'm leaving the bar. I'm going to another party. And, you know, again, I don't know about you, but when we say, you know, how many of y'all said, oh, I drive better when I'm drunk? Well, I do. I really do. Because when I'm, like, got a buzz or, or sober, I'm driving, I'm shifting gears, I'm sipping on a beer, I'm smoking a cigarette, I'm putting on Lee Press on nails, all at the same time. <laughs> but when I'm drunk, I'm focused. I pay attention to what I'm doing. And so I'm focused. And all of a sudden, I saw the light, and I wish to God one more time I could tell you it was light showing me who and what I was, but it was the red and blue ones in my rearview mirror. And... Um, I don't know about what happens to you when you drink, but I know what happens to me, and I lose all sense of logical thinking. And I immediately thought, I can outrun them. <laughs> so I hit the gas in a Pinto. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> got that baby up to 50. <laughs> and, uh... You know, again... When logical thinking kicked back in, there were several of them back there. Now, jump ahead to sobriety. 
when I got sober, I had to tell you there were nine of them back there. I had to exaggerate the story. Like, three of them isn't enough. And um, so by the time, you know, logical thinking kicks back in, I'm like, I better pull over. And um, I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Tell them something. Got to make up something. Because remember those days when everything went in slow motion except your brain and you're going a million miles an hour? And I'm like, okay, gas pedal stuck, gas pedal stuck. That sounds good, 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 good. That's what I'm going to tell them, gas pedal stuck. So as I pull over and I open up my door and I fall out into the gravel, I look up and they have me surrounded with their guns pulled. I'm like, there's no need for such hostility. And uh, they seemed to not care. And they shackled me and cuffed me and, uh, and threw me in the back of the car and off to jail one more time I went. And when I got to jail, I'm getting fingerprinted. And the guy behind the counter goes, Animal, what are you doing back here again? And I wish to God I could tell you that I sobbed on his desk saying, I don't know. I was ecstatic that I had a nickname in jail. <laughs> and so I go to jail and, and finally get bailed out. And I just go back to what I know how to do. Because, see, here's the thing is that I know my life isn't good. I know that my life is in the tank. I know that I'm in pain and I'm ashamed and I'm guilt-ridden and I'm all of those things and there's only one thing that fixes it. There's only one thing that makes the voices in my head quiet down, that makes me feel like, oh gosh, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as you think. And that's taking a drink. And what happens to me is I can't just take one drink. I need 112 drinks. Because, but you remember, like, I loved in between drink four and five. That is the best place. If only we could stay there, we wouldn't be here tonight. You know? But for me, it's always like missing my exit. Whoop! There it went. <laughs> and, um, and the next thing I know, I've got my head in a toilet. I'm sleeping with some guy in a Camaro. It's possible. I, I mean, it's just... My dream, and as Tiffany and I laugh about it all the time, I mean, we like to think that our drinking was pretty. You know, I went through a wine phase. I tried to be a wine drinker. I did it one night. The next night, I had the box of wine propped on my couch, so I just had to do this. <laughs> Nothing about my drinking was pretty. And, um,. It was sad. It was sad and painful and miserable and all of those other horrible things until I just took a drink and felt okay. And, you know, it talks about, we talk about in the big book, that the, the hideous four horsemen. Well, I would wake up to that, but it would last 37 seconds because then I would drink a mimosa because I don't drink in the morning, but that's okay. And because we were laughing about that the other day. And it was just awful. And every single day I was dying a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And so uh, it was the summer. I remember I had gone to co court over that DUI, and I told, made up some story to the judge. I was like, I have three weddings to be in this summer, and it would be devastating to them if I couldn't be in their wedding. I mean, all the planning is done, and for whatever crazy reason, this judge gave me this November court date. I mean, I don't even know if I had three friends at that time. Um, and so, you know, I had the, all I wanted was the summer to party because I did have some sense of that I was in trouble, that I, I thought I was probably not going to be in good shape. And so um, I got this job at this place. It's Deer Creek Golf Club. It's a golf club at, back at home. And, you know, I, uh, had, I had moved back in with my gay ex-boyfriend and his boyfriend until I started coming between them somehow. And um, I had to move out. And so... I moved, I didn't have anywhere to live. And so at this golf club that I worked at, there was a locker room. And so I just moved into the locker room. And it was the best setup. I mean, I had my clothes hung in the lockers. And I mean, I drank there, I worked there, I slept there. It was the best gig until one day I got fired for being late. I'm sure there were extenuating circumstances there, but it was because I was late that day that she fired me. So, I mean, I lost my home and my job in 30 seconds. And um, that, you know, what ended up happening then is I started bouncing from couch to couch, place to place, and, and um, you know, walking around with a trash bag and being at the bar every single night. And um, I remember 
I was like, God, I got something coming up. What is that thing I got? I got something big coming up. Oh, gosh, it's court. Um, and so I remember knowing I was going to be in some trouble, and I remember I called my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm, I need help. And he said, I'll call you back. I mean, I was crying, and I was desperate. And he's going to call me back? How rude. Anyway, he called me back. And what he had done is he had called that counselor, and he said, Joyce calling us, and she says she wants help. And for, thank God that counselor said, this is a good day. This is a good day. And so he called me back, and he said, we'll help you as long as you go to treatment. Well, heck, I'll always take action to get the heat off. Always. I had no intentions of being sober. I had no intentions of having a sobriety day. I just wanted the heat off. And so we went to court. Judge said, three to five years, treatment. Well, let me think about that. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll do treatment. And so I went to treatment. Again, no intention of staying sober, no intention of having a sobriety date. I got there, but I was going to be the best patient they've ever seen. We get there. We walk in, my, and people are hugging and, like, smiling and carrying stuffed animals, for God's sake. And um, my mom goes, I, I don't think this is the place for her. And my dad said, she's fine. <laughs> gone. I mean, they were, I, I was like, where'd they go? They're gone. And so I, I was doing treatment, right? I'm doing treatment. I'm just doing treatment, doing whatever they tell me to do. And I tell you what, I didn't know what it was then, but I absolutely know what it is today, and it was God. Something happened. When it talks about in the book that you can have the door ever so slightly open, I absolutely know what that means because God came in. I didn't even ask God to come in. I didn't say, please help me, God. Please just save my life, God. I want to be sober, God. But something happened, and I was transformed. And I remember having this overwhelming feeling of peace and this overwhelming feeling of willingness, and I was like, I'll do whatever it takes to keep this feeling. And I trotted myself down to my counselor's office, shared her this good news with her. She said, that's awesome. You're going to go to a halfway house. And I said, accept that. <laughs> because, again, what are at those halfway houses? Women. I want to go to Lee's halfway house. <laughs> uh, I don't like women. I don't need women. The only thing you got that I want is probably your man. And um, I have no use for you. And so, and, and the truth of the matter is, I was absolutely afraid of you. I was absolutely scared to death of you. Because I didn't know what you were going to think about me. I didn't know if you were going to like me, hate me. I, I had no idea. Because if you were anything like me, you know, you would think those things. Because that's what I was thinking. And so, um, did that halfway house and, and uh, went back home and still had to do another week of jail time and house arrest time and all of that stuff. And but what had happened is, is I did get involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started going to meetings every single day. One other thing happened um, while I was in treatment. Um, well, two things. I met an ex-husband there. Um, <laughs> but the really cool thing is that my dad, we were in small group one day, and, and the counselor said, Tom, do you have anything you want to share? And, and my dad said, yeah, my name's Tom, and I'm an alcoholic. And my, dad, and my mom hit him and said, no, you're not. It's her. And um, <laughs> because you know what, if you were to line up my drinking and my dad's drinking, it's completely opposite. It's absolutely opposite. And you know what, to me, I was the alcoholic. I didn't have a problem seeing that. I had a problem trying to see my dad's alcoholism until he talked to me about it. And you know what happened is we started celebrating our sobriety dates together. I have 10 more days than him. Get that on the tape. Um <laughs> But we started celebrating our sobriety dates together. And you talk about a relationship that grew and became something so precious. Because this was a man who wanted nothing to do with me. I was killing him. I was killing my family. And um, to, to see what it had grown into because of Alcoholics Anonymous and us both having a God in our life and being active participants in recovery. It, it, it's just, I can't even describe it. And if you've got a parent or, or something like that, you know what I'm talking about. There is nothing cooler. And so um, I just started down this deal. Now, they did tell me to do this thing called get a sponsor. And I was like, okay, I will get a sponsor. And um, I had enough sense to think to myself, I better get somebody kind of tough because I'm stubborn and I need somebody who's going to do this deal. And um, there was this woman in the meetings, and God, I loved her. She knew that book. She talked about 
the steps and she talked about living and being sober and she just was she was awesome she was nice and she she was great and then I asked her to sponsor me and Sybil came out <laughs> and um, I uh, I remember one time uh, I, she told me that not to call her after ten unless it was an emergency well it was midnight I you know I was crying to me that is an emergency <laughs> and I called her and she's like what's wrong. I said, I'm working on my fourth step. And she said, sounds like you're doing it right. Click. <laughs> One time I called her and I said, um, Barb, I, I don't even remember today what it was. I mean, somebody probably looked at me crooked in the meeting. And I called her and I was all upset. And she said, I want you to go up to Little House. That was my home group at the time. I want you to go up to Little House and clean the bathroom. And I'm like, Barb, you don't, What? I want you to go up to Little House and clean the bathroom. And I was like, did you not just hear what I did? What, I, Barb, I'm having some pain here. And she's like, did you not just hear what I said? Click. I mean, this is the woman, we would go through the book, and we would read the book together, and we'd come to a word. And she'd say, do you know what that word means? And I'd go, yeah. And she'd go, what? And I'd go, oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> And she would go, she would go, do you, if you don't know what a word means, you don't know what the sentence means. If you don't know what the sentence means, you don't know what the paragraph means. If you don't know what the paragraph means, you're going to die. <laughs> and I was like, decaf. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here and your head is about ready to spin off. And so... You know, but she's right. She's absolutely right. If I don't know what the textbook says, how am I supposed to save my life? So, um, you know, that was my sponsor. She told me I had to go back to school. I said, Barb, I have tried to go to college nine times. It is not my bag. My mother said so. And she would say, go enroll. Call me when you're done. Click. God, that woman loved hanging up on me. And so uh, I went and enrolled, and I knew that I had to do something interesting something that would keep my attention. So I got a degree in criminal justice. And uh, hopefully I don't offend anyone with this, but I'm happy to tell you that I have a BS from FU. <laughs> which, for whatever reason, feels appropriate to me. And, uh, you know, and so one more time it was proven to me that I may not believe it's going to work. I may not... I may completely disagree with the action, but as long as I'm willing to just shut up and take the action, remarkable things continue to happen in my life. It's amazing that I can't learn my lesson still today. Oh, that'll never work. And then I do it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, it worked. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. So, you know, jump ahead. I ended up going back to uh, work at that treatment center for a while. I um, I remember my sponsor decided to move to California, and, um, you know, I decided that she had done so well with teaching me that I should just sponsor myself. <laughs> so here I am. I'm working at a treatment center. I am sponsoring myself and others, and um, I have this husband that I married from treatment that smoke and crack in my basement. And I'm not talking to anybody. And, um, you know, what came a period in time, I was five years sober, and, and the thought that came to me was not one to take a drink, but the thought came to me that offing myself might be a pretty good idea. And I was five years sober. And I didn't want to drink, but I wanted to die all over again. And, you know, what seemed like probably uh, a really long time was a very brief period of time. I was still going to meetings. Um, but I got a sponsor really, really fast because that thought scared me to death. And um, I got another tough sponsor, one who said, you know what, Joy, you're going to answer the phone when it rings. You're going to go to committed meetings. You're going to be uh, you're going to be sponsoring women. You're going to take service commitments. You're going to do all of this stuff. And I was absolutely, I was absolutely, I'll do whatever. And if there's anything I can wish for anyone in this room, if you're new, is is desperation. I pray to God that you are at that desperation place where you become 
willing to do anything as the dying can be. I mean, because that's what I had to go back to that place all over again. And I got willing all over again. Um, jump ahead um, a few years. I uh, met a guy at a conference, the Sunflower Conference, no Leslie. And, um, you know, I'm known as the obnoxious raffle girl. I could teach you raffle girl something. I don't take no for an answer. <laughs> anyway, um, and I sell raffle tickets. I've done it for 19 and a half years. And um, there was this obnoxious dude following me around. More raffle tickets, more raffle tickets. Now, if he was your speaker, which he wouldn't be, but if he was telling the story, he would say, I picked him up. Well, he spent like $75 on raffle tickets. Who do you think who picked who up? Anyway, so we, yes, we fall in love. We get married. We have um, a little boy, um, which is, I apologize, wherever Adrian is, I'm going to have to skip out early on Sunday because um, it's his 10th birthday. And, uh, God, you know, from where I came from, I would never in a million years imagine that I would be flying home from Cal from Florida at a women's conference to go home to get to be with my 10-year-old, who obviously, yes, was born on 9-11. And um, I am just so grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, for those of you in this room that are going, oh, no, you people made me mad when I first had Brady because... They would, it was the most exciting, most best day of my whole life next to getting sober. And people would say, oh, God, that's awful. And I'd be like, you are so lucky I'm in the program. <laughs> I don't like making amends. Because you know what? On such a, yes, a tragic day, the most, the biggest blessing that a woman can have happened to me. And it really put my life into perspective and showed me what's important and reminded me to not take life for granted and to really just celebrate this moment that I am in. And I will forever be grateful for that. And I can't be, I, I got to be honest and tell you, if he'd have been born on September 8th, I don't think I would have the same kind of gratitude. I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, we have him. And then we had another little boy, Cooper. And um, so they're, they're nine and five and, and um, they're both crazy and I love them both. And what happened when I was pregnant with Cooper is we found out my dad had cancer. And um, I remember the day that we found out he had cancer, I was, I was supposed to go to Lawrence and give an AA talk, which I did because they keep my commitments. You know, if I, if I didn't show up just because every single time something bad happened, I wouldn't show up because what, my DVR didn't tape a show. You know, I mean, that's my brain. And so I went and gave that talk, and, and you know what? What was awesome is one year later to the day, I got to go back and give, a, I get, got to go back to the same group and speak again, and I got to share that my dad was cancer free. And then six months later, we found out it was in his brain. And, um, you know, oh gosh, um, my dad had found a specialist in New York, and, um, we were taking turns, my brother and sister and I were taking turns flying back and forth from New York, and, um, they operated, and we thought it went okay, and then um, he kind of just, they didn't call it a coma, but he kind of just went to sleep, and um, I remember the doctors telling us, you know, just talk to him, talk to him, and, and um, I remember it was my turn to go out, and um, I had downloaded on an iPod, like, all of his favorite songs, because uh, some of my favorite memories as a kid were drive, would, would be to drive across the state of Kansas and to go to Denver in our wood-paneled station wagon singing Dead Skunk in the Middle of the Road and Delta Dawn. And um, so I downloaded all of those songs, and I remember I got to the hospital, and I put little earbuds in his ears, and he wasn't awake or anything, and I started Delta Dawn, and he sang it with me. And I mean, you know, as painful as that may sound, as that memory may sound, it's my memory. It's the last memory of my dad talking. And... um I will forever cherish that. And had I been out there drinking or doing whatever I do, I'd have missed it all. I would have absolutely missed it all. And, um, you know, we brought him back home and he passed away. And I remember at the funeral, one of, you know, we are everywhere. Us people, we are everywhere. And one of our very good friends works at the local funeral home. <laughs> and um, 
he was the one that got to, that came and got my dad. And I can't tell you how much peace that brought to me to know that he was in good hands. And, um, you know, we were at the funeral, and my dad was such a prominent businessman. I mean, he was a huge, huge businessman in the city. And um, it was so funny. People, people would be coming through the line, and uh, Tiffany came through the line and introduced herself to my sister, Julie, and she says, hi, I'm Tiffany. I'm a friend of your sister's. And my sister was like, of course you are. And uh, <laughs> because you guys showed up. Y'all showed up. And, um, you know, my brother-in-law, who uh, he leaned over to me, and he was like, you have quite the entourage here, don't you? <laughs> and I have never been more proud. I have never been more proud. And um, so he died several years ago in, I don't even, in, in 07. And, and um, I miss him every single day. I miss that man every single day. And so I'm not trying to be the preachy one. I don't want to be the preachy speaker or anything like that. But I tell you what, if you have something that's undone, you go get it done. I am telling you, because when that man died, I was free. I had cleared away the past. I had swept my side of the street. And he and I was free. And I had no regret. And I'm not saying that amends can't be done after someone has died. But if there's an opportunity to do it now, you better do it now. And uh, because the reward is that much greater. The reward is that much greater. Now, I'm going to tell you, I have this sister that when I got sober, um, yeah, she didn't really care that I was sober. <laughs> At all. And I remember when I made amends to her, and she was like, yeah, whatever. And... Uh, you know, what I had to realize, and I didn't find this out till years, I was years sober, but what would happen is, I was out of that, for those of us that think our drinking when we drink alone affects no one, let me tell you this story. I was not in the home, in my parents' home, when I was doing my major bad drinking. What would happen is, my sister would come home from high school, and my mom would be so depressed, she would stay in bed all day. And my sister would come home, and she'd run through the house and clean things up and get dinner started so that when my dad got home, it looked like my mom had done something. That's what my alcoholism did to that little girl. And I don't know, how do you repay that? I mean, how do you, how do you repay that? So it's no wonder. And you know what? I'd like to tell you that she got over it in six months or six years, but it took ten. It was ten years before I realized that we were starting to build something. And uh, I remember I was in a newcomer's meeting once, and it was this guy, and he was like, man, I've been sober for 47 days, and my wife still isn't putting out. <laughs> and I was like, I can't imagine why. You have so much to offer her. <laughs> and uh, so you know what? They forgive us in their time, not our time. And uh, so now jump ahead and let me tell you about this little girl now. One day, she lives in St. Louis. I live in Kansas City. We're four hours apart. We both have two kids. She's pregnant again. We do family vacations together. We spend time together. I watch her kids when she goes out of town. I mean, it's just, again, with the gifts of the program. She calls me one day, and she goes, I go, hello. She goes, Joy. I'm like, yeah, it's Joy. Why are you whispering? <laughs> I'm at the DMV. There's a guy in front of me, he's on the phone, and he's telling somebody that he has 30 days of sobriety, but he thinks he's going to go drink tonight. What should I do? <laughs> and uh, I go, I don't know, Julie. She goes, should I talk to him? I go, yeah, why don't you? <laughs> and I was like, whatever you do, get his phone number. So... She calls me back. I get his phone number. I call him, and I said, hey, my name's Joy. I think you just met my sister, Julie. Thank you. This thing is, like, falling apart. Um, I think you just met my sister, Julie. And he goes, yeah, she almost ran me over in the parking lot. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah. He goes, I didn't know what she wanted. I thought she was trying to pick me up. <laughs> Spoken like a, tr a man with 30 days of sobriety. Yes, my sister in her Volvo and two kids in the back wants what you got. <laughs> so uh, I passed his name off to a friend of mine in St. Louis. I don't have any idea if he's sober today or not, but I know that the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous works not just with, within us, but it does 
for the people that watch us. And what happened is my sister saw that Alcoholics Anonymous works. She had doubts, but she saw that it worked. She saw that day after day, that after day after day, that I was staying sober and that I was becoming a better sister and that I was becoming a decent person. And she watched and saw the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I mean, so that's what I do today. And you know what? What's so cool is she calls me all the time when she has friends or friends of friends have friends that need to talk to somebody in AA. She calls me. She's like, wait, I have my sister sober. And uh, she's proud of me today. Again, how do I pay that back? How do I pay that back? Now, I'm going to tell you really quick. We okay? <laughs> Lee lectured me. He said, don't you dare go over. No, he didn't. Anyway, um, I have these two little kids, Brady and Cooper. Brady is going to need al -Anon. Cooper is going to be with us. And... Uh, <laughs> I tell you what, I, my sponsor, Karen, lives in California, and she called me one day, and this was several years ago. She called me one day. She goes, Joy, do you know Brady's calling me? And I go, nope. <laughs> I'm like getting a little nervous. <laughs> What's he saying? <laughs> and uh, she goes, well, it goes like this. Hey, Karen, it's Brady. I'm just checking in. Everything's good. Love you. Bye. <laughs> And I tell you, you know what? If I ever need an extra sponsor, Brady's my man. <laughs> because, uh, yes, I know this is going to be shocking. I'm on the PTO, and I'm in charge of the skating parties. I had to be in charge of parties. <laughs> and um, we were, I had to be there early. We were running late. I'm speeding through town. I mean, we're, I'm taking corners on two wheels. And um, Brady had gotten in trouble for something that day at school. He goes to a Catholic school, and we're talking about it. I go, well, maybe you should go talk to Father Mike. Oh, no. And I said, but you know what? It's not a big deal. It's kind of like with Karen. When I mess up, I call her. I tell her what's up. It's not a big deal. And he was like, oh, okay. So I'm speeding through town. He didn't miss a beat. He goes, huh, you're going to have to call Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I have this problem. I have this Captain Justice problem. And some of you may relate. I'm the type of person that I'm allowed person. I don't have prob a problem sharing my feelings, my opinions, whether you ask or not. Um, and I'm the type of person that when I'm in grocery store and I'm in the 12 item or less lane, <laughs> you better by God have 12 items or less. And I don't know why it is. I always get behind the chick who thinks she's got to do two weeks of shopping and then go in the 12 item or less lane. And you know what? The, the re I am not afraid. I shall speak for the little people. <laughs> the little people who are afraid to say something. I'm the one that's going, 12 items. You might want to try aisle four <laughs> down here. Now, it didn't occur to me that it was a problem in my life until one day I wasn't even in the 12 item or less lane. <laughs> and I was down. And I was like yelling, ma'am. Yeah. You, why don't you come down here with me? I mean, that's not good. Now, what it was, a couple months ago, we're in Branson. Branson is this little, like, silver dollar city. It's a little fun little family weekend thing. And, you know, you go see Glassblown or Blacksmith. It's where I used to go when I was a kid. And we wanted these fast pass things. And we, we had gone the first day. It was great. VIP parking. Got the fast passes. Next day we go back. VIP is full. I'm like, oh, great. Now I have to walk 200 feet. And then I go up to get the fast pass from the guy who worked there when I was a kid, obviously, because he's 110. And um, I said, I need four fast pass. He goes, we're done sold out. And I went, what do you mean you're sold out? It's, it's 10 a.m. He goes, well, we had a hundred and we just sold them all. And I mean, it's just like, I mean, it's totally cartoon. And um, I'm like, are you serious? I tell you what, this day has gone from bad to worse. This is a bunch of shit. And I take my wallet and I shove it in my purse. Brady is right here beside me. And I stomp off to him saying to the old man, I'm really sorry about her. <laughs> So 
I turn around, I make my amends. I mean, I just feel oh God. We're walking away, and Brady, all of nine, Mom, you cannot talk to people that way. <laughs> it is rude and annoying. <laughs> so, yes, he keeps me on my toes, and then there's Cooper, and I don't even know what to say about that poor child. He's into everything. I mean, you know, one day I came upstairs, and there was metal musel, a whole jar of metal musel all over the kitchen floor because it made him skate faster. <laughs> So we have our hands full. But you know what? What an awesome problem to have. What an awesome problem to have. I never thought I was going to get to have that kind of a problem. Um, my life is full today. It is absolutely full today. I get to sponsor a ton of women. I get to come to Florida with my best friend. You know, my husband sometimes travels with me when I go to speak, and it's funny. Um, I'll say, oh, I'm going to speak in Florida in September. He'll go, oh, I'll go there. Um, I'm going to speak in Sioux City in October. Eh, I'm not going to take your girls. <laughs> and so I, I was so funny because I had forgotten that this was a women's conference. So I had told him, I said, oh, by the way, you can't go to Florida. Why? And I'm like, because it's a women's conference. You're not allowed. I'm not going to tell him you were here, Lee. And uh, anyway, it's just, it's been Already, it's just been so much fun. Tiffany and I, we have so much fun when we're together because we just laugh. I mean, we laugh hysterically all the time. And, and um, I'm just really excited about this weekend. And I want to thank you again for allowing me to share um, and be with you um, to kick this thing off. I'm honored. It's a privilege. And I'm just truly honored to be here. So thank you and God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.